I could not believe what I was seeing. I could have filled the back of his head with 556, which is an absolute joke. Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome to the Midweek Show, everyone. We've got a couple of interesting stories this week. We're going back to 1924 for both stories. Uh, most people will recognize the Albert Ostman story and the miners at Mount St. Helens who were attacked. Both happened the same year. Um, a little bit different perspective for each one. So before we get into that, Tom, would you like to uh, tell the folks a couple things? Yeah, absolutely. I want to thank everybody. Uh, we've been getting some really good questions sent in, so keep them coming. We'll love them. And if you like this content, uh, smash the like button, smash the subscribe button, and you can also support us on Patreon. The link is in the description. All right. Well, everyone, stand by. We're going to play these stories, and Tom and I will return for our commentary afterwards. Screams in the night. Indian legends. Miles of footprints. Sightings. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Join us for eyewitness accounts, questions and answers, Bigfoot encounters of the past, and ongoing encounters in the present. Your host, two-time witness, field researcher for 43 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Greetings. This story is being brought to you by William Jevning and is being narrated by Jim Sower. This is a story from Albert Ostman. I have always followed logging and construction work. This time I had worked over one year on a construction job and thought a good vacation was in order. British Columbia is famous for lost gold mines. One is supposed to be at the head of Toba Inlet. Why not look for this mine and have a vacation at the same time? I took the Union steamship boat to Lund, British Columbia. From there, I hired an old Indian to take me to the head of Toba Inlet. This Indian was a very talkative old gentleman. He told me stories about gold brought out by a white man from his lost mine. This white man was a very heavy drinker, spent his money freely in saloons, but he had no trouble in getting more money. He would be away for a few days, then come back with a bag of gold. But one time he went to his mine and never came back. Some people said a Sasquatch had killed him. Now, at that time, I had never heard of a Sasquatch, so I asked what kind of an animal he called a Sasquatch. The Indian said, They have hair all over their bodies, but they are not animals. They are people, big people living in the mountains. My uncle saw the tracks of one that were two feet long. One old Indian saw one over eight feet tall. I told the Indian I didn't believe in their old fables about mountain giants. It might have been some thousands of years ago, but not nowadays. The Indian said, There may not be many, but they still exist. We arrived at the head of the inlet about four o'clock p.m. I made camp at the mouth of a creek. The Indian had supper with me, and I told him to look out for me in about three weeks. I would be camping at the same spot when I came back. Next morning, I took my rifle with me, but left my equipment at the camp. I decided to look around for some deer trail to lead me up into the mountains. On the way up the inlet, I had seen a pass in the mountain that I wanted to go through, to see what was on the other side. I spent most of the forenoon looking for a trail, but found none except for a hogback running down to the beach. So I swamped out a trail from there, got back to my camp about 3 o'clock p.m. that afternoon, and made up my pack to be ready in the morning. 
My equipment consisted of one thirty thirty Winchester rifle. I had a special homemade prospecting pick, axe on one end, pick on the other. I had a leather case for this pick which fastened to my belt, also my sheath knife. The storekeeper at Lund was cooperative. He gave me some cans for my sugar, salt, and matches to keep them dry. My grub consisted mostly of canned stuff, except for a side of bacon, a bag of beans, four pounds of prunes, and six packets of macaroni, cheese, three pounds of pancake flour, and six packets of Rye King hardtack, three rolls of snuff, one quart sealer of butter, and two one-pound cans of milk. I had two boxes of shells for my rifle. The storekeeper gave me a biscuit tin. I put a few things in that and cashed it under a windfall, so I would have it when I came back here waiting for a boat to bring me out. My sleeping bag I rolled up and tied on top of my sack. Together, with all my ground sheet and frying pan, I had one aluminum pot that held about a gallon, and as my canned food was used, I would get plenty of empty cans to cook with. The following morning, I had an early breakfast, made up my pack, and started up this mountain hog back. My pack must have been at least 80 pounds, besides my rifle. After one hour, I had to rest, and I kept resting and climbing all that morning. About 2 p.m., I came to a flat place below a rock bluff. There was a bunch of willow in one place. I made a wooden spade and started digging for water. About a foot down, I got seepings of water, so I decided to camp here for the night and scout around for the best way to get on from here. I must have been up to near a thousand feet. There was a most beautiful view over the islands in the strait. Tugboats with log booms, fishing boats going in all directions. Oh, it was a lovely spot. I spent the following day prospecting round, but no sign of minerals. I found a deer trail leading towards this pass that I had seen on my way up the inlet. The following morning I started out early while it was cool. It was deep climbing with my heavy pack. After a three hours climb, I was tired and stopped to rest. On the other side of a ravine from where I was resting was a yellow spot below were some small trees. I moved over there and started digging for water. I found a small spring and made a small trough from cedar bark and got a small amount of water, had my lunch and rested here till evening. I made it over the pass late that night. Now I had downhill and good going, but I was hungry and tired, so I camped at the first bunch of trees I came to. I was trying to size up the terrain. What direction would I take from here? Toward west would lead to low land and some other inlet, so I decided to go in a northeast direction. Had good going and slight downhill all day. I must have made ten miles while I came to a small spring and a big black hemlock tree. This was a lovely campsite. I spent two days here just resting and prospecting. The first night here, I shot a small deer. Two days later, I found an exceptionally good campsite. It was two good-sized cypress trees growing close together and near a rock wall with a nice spring just below these trees. I intended to make this my permanent camp. I cut lots of brush from my bed between these trees. I rigged up a pole from this rock wall to hang my pack sack on, and I arranged some flat rocks for my fireplace for cooking. I had a really classy setup. And that was when things began to happen. I am a heavy sleeper. Not much disturbs me after I go to sleep, especially on a good bed like I had now. Next morning, I noticed things had been disturbed during the night, but nothing missing I could see. I roasted my grouse on a stick for breakfast. That night, I filled up the magazine of my rifle. I still had one full box of twenty shells and six shells in my coat pocket. That night, I laid my rifle under the edge of my sleeping bag. I thought a porcupine had visited me the night before, and porkies like leather, so I put my shoes in the bottom of my sleeping bag. Next morning, my pack sack had been emptied out. 
Someone had turned the sack upside down. It was still hanging on the pole from the shoulder straps as I had hung it up. Then I noticed one half-pound package of prunes was missing. Also, my pancake flour was missing. But my salt bag was not touched. Now, porkies always look for salt, so I decided it must be something else than porkies. I looked for tracks but found none. I did not think it was a bear. They always tear up and make a mess of things. I kept close to camp these days in case the visitor would come back. I climbed up on a big rock where I had a good view of the camp, but nothing showed up. I was hoping it would be a porky so I would get a good porky stew. These visits had now been going on for three nights. This night it was cloudy and looked like it might rain. I took special notice of how everything was arranged. I closed my pack sack. I did not undress. I only took off my shoes, put them in the bottom of my sleeping bag. I drove my prospecting pick into one of the cypress trees so I could reach it from my bed. I also put the rifle alongside me, inside my sleeping bag. I fully intended to stay awake all night to find out who my visitor was, but I must have fallen asleep. I was awakened by something picking me up. I was half asleep, and at first I did not remember where I was. As I began to get my wits together, I remembered I was on this prospecting trip and in my sleeping bag. My first thought was, oh, it must be a snow slide, but there was no snow around my camp. Then it felt like I was tossed on horseback, but I could feel whoever it was was walking. Now I tried to reason out what kind of animal this could be. I tried to get up my sheath knife and cut my way out, but I was in an almost sitting position and the knife was under me. I could not get hold of it, but the rifle was in front of me. I had a good hold of that and had no intention to let it go. At times I could feel my pack sack touching me. I could feel the cans in the sack touching my back. After what seemed like an hour, I could feel we were going up a steep hill. I could feel myself rise for every step. What was carrying me was breathing hard and sometimes gave a slight cough. Now I knew this must be one of the mountain Sasquatch giants the old Indian had told me about. I was in a very uncomfortable position, unable to move. I was sitting on my feet, and one of the boots in the bottom of the bag was crossways with the hobnail sole up across my foot. Oh, it hurt me terribly, but I could not move. It was very hot inside. It was lucky for me this fellow's hand was not big enough to close up the whole bag when he picked me up. There was a small opening at the top. Otherwise, I would have choked to death. Now he was going downhill. I could feel myself touching the ground at times, and at one time he dragged me behind him, and I could feel he was below me. Then he seemed to get on level ground and was going at a trot for a long time. By this time, I had cramps in my legs. Oh, the pain was terrible. I was wishing he would get to his destination. I could not stand this type of transportation much longer. Now he was going uphill again. It did not hurt me so bad. I tried to estimate distance and directions. As near as I could guess, we were about three hours traveling. I had no idea when he started, as I was asleep when he had picked me up. Finally, he stopped and let me down. Then he dropped my pack sack. I could hear the cans rattle. Then I heard chatter, some kind of talk I did not understand. The ground was sloping, so when he let go of my sleeping bag, I rolled downhill. I got my head out and got some air. I tried to straighten my legs and crawl out, but my legs were numb. It was still dark. I could not see what my captors looked like. I tried to massage my legs to get some life in them and get my shoes on. I could hear now it was at least four of them. They were standing around me and continuously chattering. I had never heard of Sasquatch before the Indian had told me about them, but I knew I was right among them. But how to get away from here? That was another question. I got to see the outline of them now, 
as it began to get lighter. Though the sky was cloudy, and it looked like rain, in fact, there was a slight sprinkle. Oh, I now had circulation in my legs, but my left foot was very sore on top where it had been resting on my hobnail boots. I got my boots out from the sleeping bag and tried to stand up. I found that I was wobbly on my feet, but I had a good hold of my rifle. I asked, "'What you fellows want with me?' Only some more chatter. It was getting lighter now, and I could see them quite clearly. I could make out forms of four people, two big and two little ones. They were all covered with hair and no clothes on at all. I could now make out mountains all around me. I looked at my watch. It was 4.25 a.m. It was getting lighter now, and I could see the people clearly. They looked like a family, old man, old lady, and two young ones, a boy and a girl. The boy and the girl seem to be scared of me. The old woman doesn't seem to be too pleased about what the old man dragged home. But the old man was waving his arms and telling them all what he had in mind. They all left me then. I had my prospecting glass and my compass around strings on my neck. The compass in my left-hand shirt pocket and my glass in my right-hand pocket. I tried to reason our location and where I was. I could see now that I was in a small valley or basin about eight or ten acres across, surrounded by high mountains. On the southeast wall there was a V-shaped opening about eight feet wide at the bottom and about twenty feet high at the highest point. That must be the way I came in. But how will I get out? The old man was now sitting near this opening. I moved my belongings up close to the west wall. There were two small cypress trees there, and this will do for a shelter for the time being. Until I find out what these people want with me, and how to get away from here, I emptied out my pack sack to see what I had left in the line of food. All my canned meat and vegetables were intact, and I had one can of coffee. Also three small cans of milk, two packages of Rye King hardtack, and my butter sealer half full of butter but my prunes and macaroni were missing. Also, my full box of shells for my rifle. I had my sheath knife, but my prospecting pick was missing and my can of matches. I only had my safety box full, and that held only about a dozen matches. That did not worry me. I can always start a fire with my prospecting glass when the sun is shining, if I got dry wood. I wanted hot coffee, but I had no wood, also nothing around here that looked like wood. I had a good look over the valley from where I was, but the boy and the girl were always watching me from behind some juniper bush. I decided there must be some water around here. The ground was leaning towards the opening in the wall. There must be water at the upper end of this valley. There is green grass and moss along the bottom. All my utensils were left behind. I opened my coffee tin and emptied the coffee in a dish towel and tied it with the metal strip from the can. I took my rifle and the can and went looking for water. Right at the head, under a cliff, there was a lovely spring that disappeared underground. I got a drink and a full can of water. When I got back, the young boy was looking over my belongings, but did not touch anything. On my way back, I noticed where these people were sleeping. On the east side wall of this valley was a shelf in the mountainside with an overhanging rock looking something like a big undercut in a big tree about ten feet deep and thirty feet wide. The floor was covered with lots of dry moss, and they had some kind of blankets woven of narrow strips of cedar bark, packed with dry moss. They looked very practical and warm, with no need of washing. The first day, not much happened. I had to eat my food cold. The young fellow was coming nearer me, and seemed curious about me. My one snuff-box was empty, so I relied it toward him. When he saw it coming, he sprang up quick as a cat and grabbed it. He went over to his sister and showed her. They found out how to open and close it. They spent a long time playing with it. Then he trotted over to the old man and showed him. They had a long chatter. Next morning, I made up my mind to leave this place, 
if I had to shoot my way out. I could not stay much longer. I had only enough grub to last me until I got back to Toba Inlet. I did not know the direction, but I would go downhill, and I would come out near civilization someplace. I rolled up my sleeping bag, put that inside my pack sack, packed the few cans I had, swung the sack on my back, injected the shell in the barrel of my rifle, and started for the opening in the wall. The old man got up, held up his hands as though he would push me back. I pointed to the opening. I wanted to go out. But he stood there pushing towards me and said something that sounded like, Soka, Soka. I backed up to about sixty feet. I did not want to be too close, so I thought if I had to shoot my way out, a thirty thirty might not have much effect on this fellow. It might just make him mad. I only had six shells, so I decided to wait. There must be a better way than killing him in order to get out from here. I went back to my campsite to figure out some other way to get out. I could make friends with a young fellow or the girl. They might help me. If I only could talk to them. Then I thought of a fellow who had saved himself from a mad bull by blinding him with snuff in his eyes. But how will I get near enough to this fellow to put snuff in his eyes? So I decided next time to give the young fellow my snuff box and to leave a few grains of snuff in it. He might give the old man a taste of it. But the question is, in what direction will I go if I should get out? I must have been near twenty-five miles northeast of Toba Inlet when I was kidnapped. This fellow must have traveled at least twenty-five miles in the three hours he carried me. If he went west, we would be near salt water, and same thing if he went south. Therefore, he must have gone northeast. If I then kept going south and over two mountains, I must hit salt water someplace between Lund and Vancouver. The following day I did not see the old lady until about four o'clock p.m. She came home with her arms full of grass and twigs and all kinds of spruce and hemlock as well as some kind of nuts that grow on the ground. I have seen lots of them on Vancouver Island. The young fellow went up the mountain to the east every day, and he would climb better than a mountain goat. He picked some kind of grass with long, sweet shoots. He gave me some one day. Well, they tasted very sweet. I gave him another snuff box with about a teaspoon of snuff in it. He tasted it, then went to the old man. He licked it with his tongue. They had a long chat. I made a dipper from a milk can, and I made many dippers. You can use them for pots, too. You cut two slits near the top of any can, then cut a limb from any small tree, cut down back of the limb, down the stem of the tree, then taper the part that you cut from the stem. Then cut a hole in the tapered part, Slide the tapered part in the slit you have made in the can, and you have a good handle on your can. I threw one over to the young fellow that was playing near my camp. He picked it up and looked at it, and he went to the old man and showed it to him. They had a long chatter. Then he came to me, pointed at the dipper, then at his sister. I could see that he wanted one for her, too. I had other peas and carrots, so I made one for his sister. He was standing only eight feet away from me. When I had made the dipper, I dipped it in water and drank from it. He was very pleased, almost smiled at me. Then I took a chew of snuff, smacked my lips, mmm, said that's good. The young fellow pointed to the old man and said something that sounded like ook. I got the idea that the old man liked snuff and the young fellow wanted a box for the old man. I shook my head. I motioned with my hands for the old man to come to me. I do not think the young fellow understood what I meant. He went to his sister and gave her the dipper I made for her. They did not come near me again that day. I had now been there six days, but I was sure I was making progress. If only I could get the old man to come over to me. Get him to eat a full box of snuff, and that would kill him for sure, and that way kill himself. I wouldn't be guilty of murder. The old lady was a meek old thing. 
The young fellow was by this time quite friendly. The girl would not hurt anybody. Her chest was flat like a boy's, no development like young ladies. I am sure if I could get the old man out of the way, I could easily have brought this girl out with me to civilization. But what good would that have been? I would have to keep her in a cage for public display. I don't think we have any right to force our way of life on other people, and I don't think they would like it. The noise and racket in a modern city, well, they would not like it any more than I do. The young fellow might have been between eleven to eighteen years old, and about seven feet tall, and might weigh three hundred pounds. His chest would be fifty, fifty-five inches. His waist was about thirty-six to thirty-eight inches. He had wide jaws, narrow forehead that slanted upward round at the back, and about four or five inches higher than the forehead. The hair on their heads was about six inches long. The hair on the rest of their body was short and thick in places. The women's hair on the forehead had an upward turn like some women have. Well, they call it bangs among women's hairdos. Nowadays, the old lady could have been anything between forty to seventy years old. She was over seven feet tall. She would be about five to six hundred pounds. She had very wide hips and a goose-like walk. She was not built for beauty or speed. Some of those lovable braziers and uplifts would have been a great improvement on her looks and her figure. The man's eye teeth were longer than the rest of the teeth, but not long enough to be called tusks. The old man must have been near eight feet tall, big barrel chest and big hump on his back, powerful shoulders, his biceps on upper arm were enormous and tapered down to his elbows. His forearms were longer than common people have, but well-proportioned. His hands were wide. The palm was long and broad and hollow like a scoop. His fingers were short in proportion to the rest of his hand. His fingernails were like chisels. The only place they had no hair was inside their hands and the soles of their feet and the upper part of the nose and eyelids. I never did see their ears. They were covered with hair hanging over them. If the old man were to wear a collar, it would have been uh, at least thirty inches. I have no idea what size shoes they would need. I was watching the young fellow's foot one day when he was sitting down. The soles of his feet seemed to be padded like a dog's foot, and the big toe was longer than the rest, and very strong. In mountain climbing, all he needed was footing for his big toe. They were very agile. To sit down... They turned their knees out and came straight down. To rise, they came straight up without help of hands or arms. I don't think this valley was their permanent home. I think they move from place to place as food is available in different localities. They might eat meat, but I never saw them eat meat or do any cooking. I think this was probably a stopover place and the plants with sweet roots in the mountainside might have been in season this time of the year. They seem to be most interested in them, and the roots have a very sweet and satisfying taste. They always seem to do everything for a reason, wasted no time on anything they did not need. When they were not looking for food, the old man and the old lady were resting, but the boy and the girl were always climbing something or some other exercise, a favorite position was to take hold of his feet with his hands and balance on his rump, and then bounce forward. The idea seems to be to see how far he could go without his hands or feet touching the ground. <laughs> Sometimes he made twenty feet. But what do they want with me? They must understand I cannot stay here indefinitely. I will soon have to make a break for freedom. Not that I was mistreated in any way. One consolation was that the old man was coming closer each day and was very interested in my snuff. Watching me when I take a pinch of snuff, he seems to think it useless that I only put it inside my lips. One morning, after I had my breakfast, both the old man and the boy came and sat down only ten feet away from me. This morning I made coffee. I had saved up all the dry branches I found, and I had some dry moss, and I used all the labels from the cans to start a fire. 
I got my coffee pot boiling, and it was strong coffee, too. And the aroma from boiling coffee was what brought them over. I was sitting, eating hardtack, with plenty of butter on, and sipping coffee. Oh, and it sure tasted good. I was smacking my lips, pretending it was better than it really was. I set the can down that was about half full. I intended to warm it up later. I pulled out a full box of snuff, took a big chew. Before I had time to close the box, the old man reached for it. I was afraid he would waste it and only had two more boxes, so I held on to the box, intending him to take a pinch like I had just done. Instead, he grabbed the box and emptied it into his mouth, swallowed it in one gulp. Then he licked the box inside with his tongue. After a few minutes, his eyes began to roll over in his head. He was looking straight up. I could see he was sick. Then he grabbed my coffee can that was quite cold by this time. He emptied that in his mouth, grounds and all. That did no good. He stuck his head between his legs and rolled forward a few times away from me. Then he began to squeal like a stuck pig. I grabbed my rifle, and I said to myself, This is it. If he comes for me, I will shoot him plumb between his eyes. But he started for the spring. He wanted water. I packed my sleeping bag in my pack sack with the few cans I had left. The young fellow ran over to his mother. Then she began to squeal. I started for the opening in the wall, and I just made it. The old lady was right behind me. I fired one shot at the rock over her head. I guess she had never seen a rifle fired before. She turned and ran inside the wall. I injected another shell in the barrel of my rifle and started downhill looking back over my shoulder every so often to see if they were coming. I was in a canyon, and good traveling, and I made fast time. Must have made three miles and some world record time. I came to a turn in the canyon, and I had the sun on my left. That meant I was going south, and the canyon turned west. I decided to climb the ridge ahead of me. I knew that must have two mountain ridges between me and salt water, and my climbing this ridge, I would have a good view of his canyon, so I could see if the Sasquatch were coming after me. I had a light pack and was making good time up this hill. I stopped soon after to look back to where I came from, but nobody had followed me. I came over the edge of the ridge, and I could see Mount Baker. Then I knew I was going in the right direction. I was hungry and tired. I opened my pack sack to see what I had to eat. I decided to rest here for a while. I had a good view of the mountainside, and if the old man was coming, I had the advantage because I was above him. To get me, he would have to climb up a steep hill, and that might not be so easy after stopping a few thirty thirty bullets. I had made up my mind this was my last chance, and this would be a fight to the finish. I rested here for two hours. It was three o'clock p.m. when I started down the mountainside. It was nice going, not too steep, not too much underbrush. When I got near the bottom, I shot a big blue grouse. She was sitting on a windfall, looking right at me, only a hundred feet away. I shot her neck right off. I made it down the creek at the bottom of this canyon. I felt I was safe now. I made a fire between two big boulders, roasted the grouse, Next morning, when I woke up, I was feeling terrible. My feet were sore from dirty socks. My legs were sore. My stomach was upset from the grouse that I'd eaten. I was not too sure I was going to make it up that mountain. I finally made the top, but it took me six hours to get there. It was cloudy, visibility about a mile. I knew I had to go downhill. After about two hours, I got down to the heavy timber and sat down to rest. I could hear a motor running hard at times, then stop. I listened to this for a while and decided the sound was from a gas donkey. Someone was logging in the neighborhood. I told them I was a prospector and was lost. I did not like to tell them I had been kidnapped by a Sasquatch, as if I had told them they would probably have said, He is crazy, too. The following day I went down from this camp on Salmon Arm Branch of the Seashelt Inlet. From there, I got the Union boat back to Vancouver. That was my last prospecting trip, 
and my only experience with what is known as Sasquatches. I know that in 1924 there were four Sasquatches living. It might be only two now. The old man and the old lady might be dead by this time. That ends Albert Osman's story. Thank you for listening. Greetings. This story is being brought to you by William Jevening and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. This is the 1924 Mount St. Helens Miner's Account. July 1924 This next story received regional notoriety. It concerns a group of miners who claim to have been attacked near the slopes of Mount St. Helens in 1924 by a group of mountain devils. This story has been portrayed a number of times in films, but Often details have been left out or changed by those making the films, which implies that the men involved in the incident did not actually see their supposed attackers. This makes their story ambiguous at best. The quotes herein are from a booklet written in 1967 by the son of one of the men involved. It is the account as told to him by his father, Fred Beck. The booklet is titled... I Fought the Eight Men of Mount St. Helens. It was written and published by R. A. Beck. Rene de Hinden revealed to me some years ago that after interviewing the senior Beck, he became fully convinced that the old man was totally honest and clear of mind and memory regarding the incident. Here is what Fred Beck had to say about the events of July 1924. The Attack First of all, I wish to give an account of the attack and tell of the famous incident of July 1924 when the hairy apes attacked our cabin. We had been prospecting for six years in the Mount St. Helens and Lewis River area in southwest Washington. We had, from time to time, come across large tracks by creek beds and springs. In 1924, I and four other miners were working our gold claim, the Vanderwhite. It was two miles east of Mount St. Helens, near a deep canyon, now named Ape Canyon, which was so named after an account of the incident reached the newspapers. Hank, pseudonym for the story, a great hunter and good woodsman, was always a little apprehensive after seeing the tracks. The tracks were large, and we knew that no known animal could have made them. The largest measured 19 inches long. It was the middle of July, and we had received a good assay on our claim, and everyone was excited. I remember I had a toothache that was bothering me, and I suggested to Hank that he should take me to see the dentist. But he was so excited in the prospect of the gold mine, he barely took time to answer me. He replied that God or the devil could not get him away from there. We had all come up in his ford and I had no way to get to town unless he took me. So when we went back to our cabin on the north side of the canyon, I had a nagging toothache and little appetite for our evening meal of beans and hotcakes. Hank, though apprehensive, was still determined. We had been hearing noises in the evening for about a week. We heard shrill, peculiar whistling each evening. We would hear it coming from one ridge and then hear an answering whistle from another ridge. We also heard a sound which I could best describe as a booming, thumping sound, just like something was hitting itself on its chest. Hank asked me to accompany him to the spring about a hundred yards from our cabin to get some water and suggested that we take our rifles to be on the safe side. We walked to the spring, and then Hank yelled and raised his rifle, and at that instant I saw it. It was a hairy creature, and he was about a hundred yards away on the other side of the 81 Canyon, standing by a pine tree. It dodged behind the tree and poked its head out from time to time. Hank shot. I could see the bark fly out each time he shot. Some say that this was quite a distance to see bark fly, but I saw it. The creature, I judge, to have been about seven feet tall, with blackish-brown hair. It disappeared from our view for a short time, but then we saw it 
running fast and upright about 200 yards down the little canyon. I shot three times before it disappeared from view. We took the water back to the cabin and explained the affair to the rest of the party. We all agreed, including Hank, to go home the next morning, as it would be dark before we could get to the car. We agreed it would be unsound to be caught on the way out. Nightfall found us in our pine log cabin. We had built the cabin ourselves and had made it very sturdy. It stood for years afterwards and was visited by many sightseers until a few years ago when it burned to the ground. The circumstances of the fire I don't recall. In the cabin, we had a long bunk bed in which two could sleep, feet to feet, the rest of us sleeping on the pine boughs on the floor. At one end of the cabin, we had a fireplace fashioned out of rocks. There were no windows in the cabin, so darkness found all of us in the cabin. Calmer now, and my tooth was better. Somehow the excitement seemed to work a temporary cure on it. We were sitting around, puffing on pipes, and talking about the trip home the next day. Each of us settled down in his crude but welcome bed, and soon fell asleep. About midnight, we were all awakened. Hank, who was sleeping on the floor, was yelling and kicking. But the noise that had awakened us was a tremendous thud against the cabin wall. Some of the chinking had been knocked loose from between the logs and fell across Hank's chest. He had his rifle in his hands and was waving it back and forth as he kicked and yelled. Hank always slept with his gun nearby. It was a Remington automatic, my gun being a thirty thirty Winchester, which I still have. I helped get the chinking off him, and he jumped to his feet. Then we heard a great commotion outside. It sounded like a great number of feet trampling and rattling over our pile of unused shakes. We grabbed our guns. Hank squinted through the space left by the chinking. By actual count, we saw only three of the creatures together at one time, but it sounded like there were many more. This was the start of the famous attack, of which so much has been written in Washington and Oregon papers through the years. Most accounts tell of a giant boulder being hurled against the cabin and some even falling through the roof, but this was not the case. There were very few large rocks around in that area. It is true that many smaller ones were hurled at the cabin, but they didn't break through the roof, but hit with a bang and rolled off. Some did fall through the chimney of the fireplace. Some accounts state that I was hit in the head by a rock and knocked unconscious. This is not true. The only time we shot our guns that night was when the creatures were attacking our cabin. When they would quiet down for a few minutes, we would quit shooting. I told the rest of the party that maybe if they saw we were only shooting when they attacked, they might realize we were only defending ourselves. We could have had clear shots at them through the opening left by the chinking. We had chosen to shoot, to, but we chose not to. We did shoot, however, when they climbed up on the roof. We shot round after round through the roof, we had to brace the hewed log door with a pole taken from the bunk bed. The creatures were pushing against it, and the whole door vibrated from impact. They pushed against the walls of the cabin as if trying to push the cabin over. But this was pretty much an impossibility. As previously stated, the cabin was a sturdy building. Hank did most of the shooting. The rest of the party crowded to the far end of the cabin, guns in their hands. The others clutched their rifles. They seemed stunned and incredulous. The attack continued the remainder of the night, with only short intervals between. A most profound and frightening experience occurred when one of the creatures, being close to the cabin, reached an arm through the chinking space and seized one of our axes by the handle. A much written about incident, and a true one. Before the thing could pull the axe out, I swiftly turned the head of the axe upright so that it caught on the logs. At the same time, Hank shot, barely missing my hand. The creature let go, and I pulled the handle back in and put the axe in a safe place. A humorous thing I well remember was Hank singing, If you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone, and we'll all go home in the morning. 
He did not mean to be humorous in saying under the impression that the mountain devils, as he called them, might understand and go away. The attack ended just before daylight. Just as soon as we were sure it was light enough to see, we came cautiously out of the cabin. It was not long before I saw one of the ape-like creatures standing about 80 yards away near the edge of the ape canyon. I shot three times, and it toppled over the cliff, down into the gorge some 400 feet. Then Hank said that we should get out of there as soon as possible and not bother to pack our supplies or equipment. After all, he said, it's better to lose them than our lives. We were all only too glad to agree. We brought out only that which we could carry in our pack sacks. We left about $200 in supplies, powder, and drilling equipment. I tried to persuade everyone not to relate the happenings to anyone, and they agreed. But Hank soon let the cat out of the bag. We made our way to Spirit Lake, and Hank went to the ranger station. He had told the ranger earlier about the tracks, and the ranger replied, Let me know if you find out what they are. That was just what Hank did, to the puzzlement of the ranger. The group returned to Kelso, Washington, where the story leaked out. And the rest is history. This ends the reading of the 1924 Mount St. Helens Miner's Account. Thank you for listening. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed those two stories. Tom and I are going to discuss them a little bit. We're going to do Albert Austin's story first. Um, I had a few things I jotted down. You know, the first thing I want to mention is you know, I can quote Rene de Hinden as saying, and I asked him this many, many years ago, what he thought of the story. And he told me he had stayed in touch with Albert Ostman for many years, I think upwards of 20 years. And, um, you know, they talked about it all the time, the story. And he told me in the final end that he felt the story was made up because Ostman kept changing the details from year, year to year. The details would change and, and much of the story would change, not just the details but the telling but anyway i thought well let's let's take a look at some of the particulars and uh kind of get away from that i mean you know we can uh take or leave what renee de hinden had to say he knew the man personally but let's take a look at some of the details so we had to the first thing i thought about was what was sleeping bags what were sleeping bags like in 1924 the sleeping bag was invented in 1876 um, but Tom, they weren't much more, you did a little research on it, weren't much more than bedrolls at that time period, were they? Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my opinion after looking at it was, uh, you know, the bags were pretty wimpy, but the, uh, that generation was pretty stout if they went camping in those things. <laughs> yeah. I remember we're going to, we're going to try to make the card with a sleeping bag from that time period, as close to the time period as we can. And when you see the picture, you can see. There wasn't a whole lot to him. So the reason I bring the sleeping bag up is um, he claims he was carried on the back of one of these creatures for a long, long distance, you know, up and down hills. In fact, he was dragged on the ground a few times. And looking at the sleeping bag, I'm thinking, well, you know, if a guy's small, you know, maybe, but it would seem to me it would tear open fairly easy. But not just that. He also had his thirty thirty rifle. In the, in the sleeping bag, his pack sack full of his food and tins, his hobnail boots, he had his compass and prospecting glass around his neck, he had a knife on his belt. Um, I mean, he had everything to make coffee, he had, he had food to last him. Um, so all this was inside the sleeping bag with him. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I mean, it's kind of stretching credibility a little bit there. So then when he made his escape from the creatures, he says he rolled up, before he rolled out, he, before he did, he rolled up his sleeping bag. Getting ahead of myself there. And he put it inside the pack sack. So the pack sack couldn't have been very big, which means the sleeping bag wasn't very big. And that coincides with that one picture you said, you sent me, Tom, from the 1940s of a sleeping bag. It looked pretty small. Um... So when he made his escape, 
Uh, he ran for three miles, he said, made record time because his pack was so light. Again, that kind of reaffirms the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of material. There. So my question is, you know, was it strong enough for for all the uh, rigor that it went through with the weight and, and all that stuff? Tom, what do you think? Well, I, I want to start off by saying that I love campfire stories. And... <laughs> And this is, you know, and I read this story many, many years ago. And to say, you know, and again, I I appreciated the fact that it was a a good, I thought a real good yarn for telling around the campfire. Uh, It it doesn't, it doesn't seem to uh, harmonize with any of the other behaviors or anything else with Bigfoot. And, you know, did, did Bigfoot just throw it over his shoulder like a big hairy Santa Claus the whole way, or did he drag him along? Because if he dra- if he drag him along for even say fifty yards, hundred yards, you're just going to get the heck beat out of you. The sleeping bag is going to get torn up, um, and he all did, that. And he did say it was he was dragged a few times. Yeah, yeah, and in that area, well. Yeah, so there are a, rocks. Here's another question too, and we have to think about this. You know, Sasquatches don't do things without any particular reason. I mean, they're very, very pointed in the things they do and the reasons they do them. So, what was the purpose of going through all the effort to collect this person with all of his goodies and carry him off for apparently miles? Yeah, and not make a meal out of them or something <laughs> else. So Yeah, I mean, it just kind of, I don't know, it doesn't sound right. Well, and you and I were talking about this just a moment ago before we got on the air, and that is the one of, one of the key elements was the Sasquatch ate the snuff, and it made him violently ill. Mm. And I thought back to the uh, Colt story where the... Uh, a uh, postal digger came in and and dropped off some radishes. <laughs> well, no, the family the family would give the Sasquatches the radishes, but they wouldn't eat them. The uh, the horse would eat them. But then when you know that PhD popped in there when he wasn't supposed to and left a whole bunch of junk, uh, that made him angry. Yeah, and so if the junk, which was, was I, I don't remember, it do was, you remember it what was, it was? It was fruit and vegetables, a box. They did take the box of donuts, but they had a hibachi with some meat on it, and just you know, the, the only thing I noticed when I, when the family called me there was there was one of the turnips was bitten in half, and it was a pretty good sized turnip, and you could see these big blocky teeth where it had bitten into this thing, bitten through it, and it had apparently been thrown down. The creatures went to the neighboring ranch, tore the garden completely up. So they uh, they were not happy with this situation. Right. So if they did that with stuff, I get the donuts. I would have taken the donuts too. <clears throat> but why wouldn't they have just, you know, they eat the snuff, right? At, you know, he eats the snuff, he stuffs it in his mouth, and then they eat it like a food item. I would think that if we wouldn't eat we wouldn't have heard from Albert Ospin ever again. Well, my question is too, is, I mean, now he states that, uh, when he, when he, the old man was sick and he went, ran to the spring for water. He grabbed his stuff and took off to the opening in, in the rocks and the older female come chasing after him. And, and he, he suggests that it may have never seen a rifle because he shoots over its head and I'm thinking, well, you know, in my experience with witnesses, you know, in these kinds of situations, that if they're coming after you, it doesn't usually slow it down to shoot at them. Um, you know, I know it's on What was my, the caliber? 30-30. Yeah. He could have shot it in the chest, and it wouldn't have slowed it down. I, I've talked to witnesses that have done that, and it didn't slow the creatures down. Right? Yeah, so, I was thinking of... I'm thinking, I mean, he was, he had to go many miles to leave that area. Why didn't they come after him? You know, he, he suggests that because, you know, the old man was sick from the snuff, that that was the end of the issue. I, I kind of doubt that. I mean, personally, I mean, we've heard many things, you know, where these, these creatures do. And, 
Um, you know, maybe it did. Maybe they did. I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, again, combine some of these questions, and there's a lot of questions with um, any, any claims that he didn't know anything about Sasquatch until um, he asked, I think it was his guide, Indian guide, and I think Green had mentioned that he had spent time around Indian camps prior to all this, and he, and he certainly would have heard stories about the Sasquatch. So you he, know what I think? He felt that's where he got the details to make up the story. Yeah. I think Albert Osman just missed his calling in life. He should have written a little dime story novels. <laughs> well, folks, you know, it's it's up to you, but, you know, you know, we want to just throw some of these details out. And I would say, you know, if you can, you want to do a little research, go back and find out what sleeping bags. And it, this happened in 1924, so the sleeping bag wasn't, you know, I don't think it was manufactured that year. It was probably something he had. But let's say 1924. You know, find out what sleeping bags were like in 1924. You know, would they have been up to the task of all the things that his went through that he claims? So to contrast this story, we have the uh, the miners at Mount St. Helens of the same year. <clears throat> and I think, excuse me, one of the... Um, one of the features of that story, of course, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the first time you knew about the creatures at the mining camp. You know, they talked about seeing tracks periodically along the Lewis River. And I know that area, and, and there's plenty of Sasquatch activity for, you know, not just decades, geez, the past couple hundred years at least in that region. So, uh, entirely possible. Uh, I remember, you know, reading something where somebody claimed that the the cabin site had been lost for all the de those decades, and that's not true. Everybody knew where it was. It's at the head of Ape Canyon. Uh, we hiked there in 1976, and uh, I got the information from college students at Portland, Oregon, and they told me exactly how to find where the cabin was. It burnt down in the 60s, but we were able to find it pretty easily um, as you come up what's Windy Ridge now, it used to be Windy Pass, and then hike along the east side of the mountains on the Plains of Abraham, you're heading south, and when you come to the head of Ape Canyon, it's just before that, so that's the location of the cabin, or where the cabin was. But, uh, you know, they shot at one of the creatures, and that seemed to enrage them. I mean, it, it, it's what precipitated the attack on the cabin. So we can compare that to Ostman's story, you know, I mean, you do little things that offend the creatures, and it, it's really taken out of context with them. So, you know, in both cases, they were shot at. He shoots at the female, Osman does, and then uh, Beck shoots at one of the creatures, and both miss the creatures. But in one case, they don't seem to be bothered by that. The other case, they throw rocks and attack the cabin. What do you think, Tom? Well, yeah, and you know, so it's it's their actions towards the creatures was uh, aggressive, provocative, and you know the creatures reciprocated that night, you know, on the cabin. And how many times have we heard about cabins being slapped and sometimes even going inside the cabin? So it kind of makes and the cabin had been there for a while, so the creatures knew sure. where the cabin was. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I love the story. It's to me, it seems credible. I mean, it has all the elements that are the repeating patterns that we see with these things. Yeah, I thought these two stories would have been really good together. You know, to compare and contrast. You know, one against the other, especially since they were the same year, and um, you know, and the one thing about Osman's story. It's a standalone story. It's this situation has never been repeated, whereas the, the guys at Mount St. Helens, this kind of thing has happened time and again. Yeah, that was. I think that's kind of my takeaway as well. That uh, Oswin's story was just very, very unique. And again, that's why I said he missed his calling. He had a great imagination, in my opinion, and wrote a, you know, came up with a. <laughs> really good interesting story and be a great campfire story and right, dime store right. novel well that's our our two cents folks anyway um you know we just kind of throw those things out our thoughts you know for you folks to uh 
to chew on and see what you think and you know maybe you'll think of things that we didn't so tom any final thoughts before we wrap this up no i just want to uh, say they're both interesting stories and uh, again i just want to say if you have uh, an encounter of your own if you know somebody with an encounter if you want to come on the show shoot us an email at questions at creekdevil.com and uh, also leave a comment we'd love to hear from you absolutely all right folks well that'll do it for this wednesday stay tuned for the weekend show thanks for listening to this episode of creek devil if you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com that's william j-e-v-n-i-n-g at yahoo.com All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.